Will, bow with me as we uh, pray to God as we begin this session. Our, our eternal God and Father in heaven, we come before your presence with thanksgiving. Father, you are our God. We're so thankful for all that you do. We don't tell you enough about how truly great and wonderful you are. But Lord, we're thankful for all that is true about you, all that you've revealed, all that you've blessed us with through Jesus, that great sacrifice that brings us all here tonight. We're thankful, Father, for your vision for the church and knowing what we needed in order to make the church strong, what we need to fulfill your vision for lost souls and leadership. We're thankful for the concept of elders and deacons. We're thankful for your vision in giving us those men who truly desire to want to do your will in their lives. And Father, we have some men here that are elders and we're thankful for them. We are thankful for their lives and their dedication. We have some elders that are here who serve for over 50 years. And we're so thankful for their love for you. It's not always easy to lead people by example. Father, we're so thankful that we have men who are willing to do it. And we have some men here tonight who have a desire to want to become elders and want to learn what's involved with that so that they might prepare themselves for the eventuality of doing that great service for you. And I pray for that reason, Father, that you'll be with your servant, David. We're thankful, Father, for his great love for the gospel. We're thankful for the whole Shannon family, for his wife, his family, the way that they are dedicated and show their faithfulness in serving you in Tennessee and different places around the world. I pray, Father, that you'll bless him tonight as he stands before us and breaks into us the bread of life that will help us to truly lead your flock in the way that we should go. We are thankful, Father, again for those who have come and pray that you'll be with us as we separate and go to our homes later on this evening. Be with those who are continuing to try to make their way here. Bless and keep us in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we want to welcome everyone that's here, our, our visitors from the local congregations for accepting this invitation, our members spending their time to come out this Friday night to bring their children and to, again, hear Mr. Shannon, a portion of his word that he's got. Before I do his uh, introduction, though, I want to state that we'll do this first session for spiritual leadership of, for elders. Then we're going to take about a 15-minute break. We'll go downstairs. We've got some refreshments drinks and waters and candies and things like that. Restroom breaks if you need it, then we'll come back up and we'll do the second session for tonight. And that'll be on the spiritual leadership for deacons. But to get Mr. Shannon as much time as possible, we want to go ahead and let you know, um, as he came here again from Mount Juliet, Tennessee, he grew up in the Bushy com community in Centerville, Tennessee. He's the son of Roy and Clara Shannon. He began preaching at the young age of 14 for small congregations in his area. But while he was at Fried Hardman University, he was studying business and the Bible. He met his wife, Tracy. Their children are Colton, who works for the Great Oaks Congregation in Memphis. Lacey is married, and she lives in Mount Juliet. And the youngest, Emily, is at Harding University. And God has blessed him with two additional sons, Ron Gang, and he's at Tennessee Tech University, and Chris Malone at Fried Hardeman. And the Shannon's love for laughter and a large supper table late at night with the kids and occasional snow skin together, some of their pastimes that they enjoy. 
Um, but being part of the Mount Juliet congregation is one of the greatest blessings he states that he's ever received from God. So without taking much more time, Mr. Shannon, we at the Buford Church of Christ welcome you and look forward to your service this evening. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Look forward to it and uh, look forward to the time tomorrow. Again, if you're a guest from another congregation or the area, we welcome you. We appreciate you being here tonight. I appreciate the Buford uh, congregation's hospitality. It's been wonderful to spend already a few hours uh, with some from this congregation and, and just hearing the good that, that goes on here on a daily basis in the life of this congregation is really, really encouraging. God has blessed you richly, and that's wonderful uh, to hear about and to see. If you would be, open your Bibles to Acts the 20th chapter. In just a few minutes, we'll get there to Acts the 20th chapter. A young rabbi came out of school, and he was placed into a temple just outside a, a village area, and a little small village. And when he got there, he would read the Shema. And as he would read it, it, it was just the most confusing thing to him. He was young. They didn't teach him this in school, what to do in the rabbinic schools. And so, so uh, what he would do is he would read it, and half the congregation would stand during it, and the other half would sit during it. And, and the side that was standing uh, would, would be motioning the whole time during the prayer and, and telling them in loud whispers, stand up, stand up. And uh, the other side that was sitting, they would be doing just the opposite during the, the reading of it. The whole time they would be like, sit down, sit down. And it was just a huge fiasco while you're supposed to be doing this reverent reading of, of what they considered a prayerful way to live. And, and so this young guy, he just didn't know what to do about this. And finally one day he heard, that a charter member that was a hundred years old was still alive and he lived outside the village and, and that uh, he was a very wise old man. He just wasn't able to leave his home anymore, but his mind was still very keen. And so oh, he couldn't wait. He said, I've got to go see this man. And so he went and he introduced himself and he visited just a few minutes and he said, I've got to tell you why I'm here. And he said, okay. And he said, when I stand up to read the Shema, he said, the strangest thing has gotten to where it happens. And he said, I figure if I could speak to them from your wisdom about what the original tradition of this congregation is, he said, I figure it would bring a lot of peace. So he said, right now, there's this group that stands up during it. And the old man says, no, no, that's not our tradition. And he says, oh, okay, so it's the ones that remain seated during it. He says, no, no. He says, well, right now there's just a lot of fighting going on back and forth during the whole thing. He said, now that's our tradition. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. It's interesting where we grow up, what we see, and what we have come to recognize as the norms that are traditions. And then it's interesting to move somewhere else, go somewhere else, and see that that tradition doesn't hold. And then it becomes usually a huge question mark. Is this an area of tradition only? Or is this an area of doctrine? What's interesting is, a lot of the time when we think about elders, how much of what we think about elders is what is taught in Scripture, and how much of it is what we have just seen where we have grown up, or where we attend, and we accept because it's always been done that way, that that's the way it's supposed to be done. Tonight, if I were to say to you in a simple sentence, define what is a leader, what do leaders do? And just a simple sentence. And I'm not saying in defining this, you have to define everything about an elder. I'm not trying to trap you. I'm really not. I'm just trying to get your minds churning. What does a leader do? What is leadership? If you had to put leadership into one simple phrase, one simple sentence... You know, there are a lot of leadership books written. It's really become a popular topic in the last 25 years, which is interesting because before that it wasn't nearly that popular of a topic. But now you go to, to bookstores and libraries and you see book after book after book. What is it that 
Now you pull out a book and, and leadership seems to almost be so complicated now that, that you have to have volumes of books to understand it. And I just kind of pause and think about that. Is it really that complicated? Or maybe do we overcomplicate it? What is leadership? I understand that what I'm about to say to you is not a full and complete definition that you would want to take and say that's the only thing I want to know about leadership. But tonight, especially as we think about elderships, I'd like for you to think about leadership from this perspective. Leaders move people. If you can't move people, you're not a leader. If you are a leader, you say, what do I do? You move people. Everybody is at point A. Now their point A is not the same. But everybody here tonight, you have your point A that is the present time. Where are you spiritually? There may be someone here that says, you know, I was just baptized this year. Okay, you're a babe in Christ spiritually. That's where you are today. There may be someone that says, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to know about Jesus all my life. I have been a Christian for 60 years. All right, that's where you are. You, you are at your point right now. Now the question is, where could you be spiritually in a year from now? Where could you be spiritually five years from now? The ultimate point B is, where will you spend eternity? Here's what's interesting. People do not move from point A to point B without leadership. And I would assume that out of this many folks, there's some of you challenging that right now. And I don't blame you. I wouldn't believe it because I said it either. But I'm just saying, I want you to tuck that in your back pocket, and I want you, as you read the Scriptures over this next five or six months, and you look at different stories, and as you just look at real life, I want you to notice something. That when people move in the right direction, they always move under leadership. People do not move without leadership. Let's just... Let's just open in our mind's eye the Bible and let's just fan through a few pages and we can't take the time to... We could be here for hours and hours tonight if we kept doing this. But think about it. Here's one example. The children of Israel were in, under uh, Egyptian slavery. And God had already planned in the sense of His providence possessed Canaan's land. People were here. Their land is waiting for them. But they didn't move until who came along? They didn't take one step, not one step toward the promised land until a leader named Moses came along. And he led them right up to the edge. Oh, but wait a minute. You must be flawed in your thinking, David. Because remember, there was a time that they didn't follow the leader. That's right. Remember, there were 12 spies. And 10 spies came back with a wicked report. And that day, that day, not in position, but in influence, who became the leader that day? That day, the 10 spies became the leader. And everybody said, you know what? We're not going to believe Joshua. We're not going to believe Caleb. Moses, whatever influence you have right now in this situation, we're not believing you. We're believing these guys that say that the giants are too bad, the fortified cities are too strong. We're not following you anymore. Okay, so notice, the children of Israel didn't move back without leadership. They've moved back with poor leadership. And so now they're back in the wilderness wondering, and of course, God immediately up erupted things and the punishment kind of put them in their place and so they began to follow Moses again. So now 40 years they're following Moses, they come back up to the edge again. And remember this is why we have the book of Deuteronomy written. Moses knows that he's not going to be allowed to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And so he wants to give them one last reminder of the law. And so he does. Alright, so now the question is, all they got to do is go over the river there and, and possess the land. And God's going to give them the victory. So you don't need a leader for that, right? 
You know the story. Immediately upon Moses' death, God comes down and He speaks to Joshua and He tells Joshua, you're going to be the leader. And Joshua goes in and He leads them. Now that they're at home, they don't need a leader, right? No, God appoints judges. And then when the people looked around and said, we want to be like the other people, God allowed them to have kings. All right, now we're not going to spend this much time on the next two or three examples, but I just want you to see this. So we open up, we open it up the New Testament. The great Messiah is on this earth. Jesus Christ. Who's He spend the most time with? The multitude or the twelve? I would think the way I see it, and, and I know you might could argue this a little bit, but it seems like to me He spends the most time with the twelve. Why, if you came to this earth to save the whole world, why did you spend the most time with the twelve instead of the most time with the multitude? Well... He knew that after his death, he'd live for 40 days, and then he would ascend into heaven, and 10 days later, the church would be established. Did you get that order there? After he ascends, 10 days later, the church is going to be established. Will a church move forward without leadership? Absolutely not. And so he was training those 12 to be the leaders of that church. In Acts 2... The twelve leaders stood and preached. The church was established. And throughout the book of Acts, we see the church moving forward under the leadership of the apostles. And we come to Acts 14, and something huge happens. Now, instead of the church only being in her infancy, we see a mark of maturity. Because at the end of that missionary journey, Paul came back through and he appointed what? Elders in every congregation. And so what we see through the rest of the New Testament is we do not see additional apostles being appointed. What we see is that elders in every congregation, God's plan, whether it is among a nation of His people like Israel, or if it's His church, if it's infancy with apostles, and her maturity with elders, or even our homes. God wants the men to be the head or the leader of the home. People do not move forward in the right direction from A to B without a leader. So then it becomes the responsibility of elders to know who you're leading. How can you help them get from A to B if you don't even know what A is? Do you know where your flock is spiritually? They're not all at the same place. So that means we have to start learning them individually. And then do you know the obstacles that that individual faces to get to B? And it becomes quite a daunting challenge to think that as elders we're striving to lead people so that one year from now they've grown spiritually. One year from now they look a little bit more like Christ. One year from now they're still on the path of eternal life. So as we think about that, I can't help but think about Acts the 20th chapter. Because in Acts the 20th chapter, beginning at verse 17, we have one of the most most unique passages in all the Bible as it deals with leadership. There are many other passages in the Scripture that deal with leaders and great teachings in those too. So this isn't a comparison to say, hey, let's vote one better than the rest. I'm simply saying this one is unique because when he gathers and has this gathering, almost like a, a, a farewell tour workshop with them, The only ones that we know that are present from verse 17 down to the end of this chapter in 38 is an ordained apostle and elders. Isn't that interesting? That's the only people we know that are present here. And so it's pretty awesome to look at a passage and and think about it from this standpoint. If, If you as an eldership If Paul could come down and talk behind closed doors to just you, 
What would Paul say? Now what's also neat about this passage is that he called the elders of Ephesus down to meet him because the Holy Spirit was giving him a prophetic message that something horrible was going to happen to him back in Jerusalem. He interpreted that, that it meant that he was going to die in Jerusalem. Now we read on and find out that he wasn't. He's going to be arrested. But, but he's thinking, I'm going back to Jerusalem to die. And he's thinking, okay, if, if kind of like Moses, if I had to give a, a final, hey, this is what I want you to know before I die, who all would I want to say that to? Well, remember on his missionary journeys, he spent the most time at Ephesus. Apparently he loved those people and he loved that surrounding, he loved that church. He spent almost three years at Ephesus. That's a long time for the traveling missionary uh, Paul. And, and so he stayed there. He, he grew to love those people, no doubt, dearly. And so now as he's traveling back, probably very heavy hearted in one sense, you know, now Paul made it very clear in Philippians, he was ready to die and he thought it was better to go and be with the Lord. So I don't mean spiritually heavy hearted in that way. I'm talking about heavy hearted in the sense of ministry. Okay, I think I'm going to Jerusalem to die. Who is it I need to check on? Who is it that I need to give some more uh, admonishing and encouraging? Who is it that I need to point in the right direction? I don't know exactly how all of his mind was working, but I know this. He thought he was going back to die, and he thought, you know what? As I travel back, I don't have time to go up to Ephesus, but I could get those elders to meet me down in Miletus, and I have some things I want to share with them. I want to remind that church of Ephesus of some important things. He loved all. He, he lived there. He knew them. He loved that church. And he wanted to leave some farewell remarks to them, uh, great teaching type remarks. And so I'd like for you to notice in Acts the 20th chapter, let's read in verse 17 from Miletus. He sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility and with many tears and trials, which happened to you by the plotting of the Jews. Now notice this phrase. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Back in verse 17. Paul wants to urge that church in Ephesus on as he thinks he's going back to Jerusalem to die. So who does he call? Isn't it wonderful? He called the youth group. Because he'd been listening to everybody's prayers. And you know the prayer, Lord, please be with our youth. They are the future of your church. And so he thought, okay, I'm concerned about the future of the church and I'm going to die and so I'm going to call the youth group down and I'm going to give a final farewell address to the youth group. Isn't it interesting? He was concerned about the church there. But he didn't call the youth down. Because it's not the youth that lead people from point A to point B. Oh, I'm so concerned about our youth today. I'm afraid they're just going to lead us in the wrong direction. No. Youth don't lead people. No disrespect. No disrespect. Youth, youth don't lead people. Let's, let's get this straight. In the Lord's church, elders lead people. Well, isn't it neat? What Paul decided to do was call down those that are middle-aged. Because, you know, they have children... That, that are oftentimes still teenagers and, and young 20s. And, and so if you want the pulse of anything happening in the life of a congregation, just ask somebody middle age, Because they know their peer group. They know their children's peer group. And they usually have parents still alive. And they know their parents' peer group because when they go to have lunch on Sunday, their parents unload everything. I just can't believe this. I can't believe And they sit around the lunch table and they hear their teenagers say, oh, did you know this is happening? And the middle age, whether they like it or not, they're just, they are like the middle link to all the generations. And so if you want to connect with a pulse of what's happening in the life of a church, just go to the ones that's middle age. You might like what you hear, you might not like what you hear, but I guarantee you, they got their hands on the pulse. That's why I oftentimes tell elders, you better listen to your deacons. I'm not saying listen as in obey them. I'm saying listen to what they're saying because they have a pulse on the entire congregation. So the good thing is Paul knew that. And he said, you know what, I, wanna, I want to touch that church of Ephesus, so I'm going to call down all the middle age. 
He didn't do that, did he? When he wanted to touch the future of that church, he called down the elders. Because they're the ones that lead the youth. They're the ones that lead the middle age. They're the ones that lead the church. A church does not go in a different direction of her leadership. I know somebody's thinking, oh yeah, they do. You're right. When they do, it's called a church split. But other than that, long term, a church does not travel a different direction than her leadership. I want you to imagine a scenario in your mind where maybe you vacation the same place every year and you say, you know what, I've been going on vacation every year for the last 25 years to this certain location and I popped into that Church of Christ there for the last 25 years and I want to tell you something. Every time I go there, they are the most friendliest church I've ever seen. I want to tell you something about the eldership of that church. The elders in that church are going to be friendly folks because the church doesn't travel in a different direction than the eldership. All right, you say, you know what, I've been going to that church for, and I tell you what, for a lot of years, they are one of the most mission-minded churches. They go on mission trips, they study with people locally. I tell you what, that is a mission-minded church. Let me tell you something about their eldership. Without exception, their eldership will be mission-minded because the church doesn't go in a different direction than their leadership long-term. There may be some little short-term curves, but long-term, it doesn't go in a different direction. You know, I've been going down to that church from time to... Let me tell you something. That church is over to the left. Let me tell you something about their eldership. Their eldership is something to the left. I tell you about that church, they're way to the right. They've been that way a long time. Their eldership is way to the right, and they've been that way a long time. If you think I'm overemphasizing it, I'm doing it for a reason. If you don't get anything out of this session tonight except this, I hope you will get this. A church doesn't go in a different direction than our leadership. And that's why it behooves an eldership to very carefully walk with God in everything. There is no more important thing that you can do than to make sure that you stay faithful, middle of the road, walk with Christ, hand in hand, footstep in footstep in everything. And yeah, set out to be a church that loves people more than any other church you've ever seen because you love them the way Christ loved them. Set out and win souls all over the world because you're doing what the Lord said, go into all the world. Set out to be firm to the old paths. And then just know that that is what the congregation can expect also. So we see here in verse 17, He called the elders down. And when He called them, He reminded them, and and by the way, you can do this all the way through this, 17 down to verse 38. What's interesting is there's really two things that he does over and over. Sometimes he will just talk to them about leadership. But then many times through here, as he talks to them about leadership, either before or during or after, he's making a point. He will say, and it won't be these exact words, but he's saying, you remember me, the leader that came in among you. Remember how I did that? I was simply doing it that way because that's the way God wanted us to do it as leaders. Now the church isn't led by apostles. Now it's led by you guys, elders. I lived among you for three years. Not only did I tell you how to lead, I showed you how to lead. And I want to encourage you, especially if you're an elder, I beg you to go home, and not for a day or two, Promise yourself you'll read this passage every day for like two or three weeks. And think, why is it that this is in the Bible? What is it that God wants me to learn as an elder? And what's going to just leap off the pages is Paul over and over saying, I was an example of how you're supposed to be as a leader.
And now I'm telling you a reminder, this is how you ought to be as a leader. Like for example, look, look right here as, as we go into verse 18, what we just read. And when they had come to Him, He said to them, what's the first thing He said? You know from the first day I came to Asia. In what manner I always lived among you. Now pause there. What, what do you think He's about to say to them? He's about to say, hey, go back and think. You saw the manner, the type of life that I lived among you. Then he elaborates. Serving the Lord. How? Number one, serving the Lord. How? With all humility. And then, even in times of hardships and persecution, with many tears and trials, happening daily by the plying of the Jews. And then, what did he do? I kept nothing back that was helpful. You see the examples here? This is what I did. Remember? Apostles, what should you do? You should think about the manner of life you're living. I reflected Christ. Are you reflecting Christ? I serve the Lord. Are you serving the Lord? I did it completely out of humility. Are you doing it completely out of humility? I did it even when the going got tough. Now I'm going to say something that's almost unfair for me to say it like it's no big deal. It's a huge deal. When he wants to resign because people are being hard on him. Number one, we could debate whether or not people ought to be hard on you. But that's not what we're talking about here. The question is, are you going to serve the Lord? Remember, that's why we're doing it. The Lord. See there in that passage? Serve the Lord with humility in trials and tears. When a brother or sister in your congregation says some kind of cutting remark, or stabs you in the back so bad that you go home at night and cry. You still be just as determined to be a faithful servant of the Lord with humility the next day. I just want to challenge you tonight that there may be reasons that you need to resign one day as an elder, but don't ever let it be because it was painful. Can you imagine what Paul would have done? How long the longevity of his ministry would have been if he would have stopped the first time somebody brought tears to his eyes. So let's read that one more time there. At the end of 18, he says, This is the manner I always lived among you. Serving the Lord, that's what it's all about, with all humility, with many tears and trials, heavy burdens, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. That's his own countrymen. And then it didn't stop him from giving his all. Look at this, how I kept nothing, I kept back nothing, that was helpful. Okay, in the little time that, that we have left here, in these last ten minutes, I want us to really think about that last phrase where he says, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. Now I know in context, and it's always important to study Scripture in context, right? And I know if, if we were to go to the limited context, he's talking about especially what he preached. Because the very next words are, are what he taught and the wisdom that he gave. He says, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly. And you remember this is the same chapter when you drop down to 27, when he was able to say to those same men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And so I don't want, I don't, number one, I don't want to take this out of context. And so, I want you to see, that's no doubt the context. He's able to say to them, listen, anything you needed to hear, I would not hold it back. But Paul, you know if, you're, if you say that, you're going to get some persecution. I tell you what, I'll say it. I'll suffer the persecution. I'll go home and I'll cry. I'll shed my tears. But I'll get up the next day and I'll serve the Lord in humility. And I still won't hold back what needs to be said. Now notice, and what he's saying is not... Arrogant in your face. Next day, it's still in humility. What a beautiful example. But I want you, by a broader application, if I may, I want you to think about that mentality for a minute. What does a leader do 
when he doesn't hold back anything that is helpful to his flock. What would that look like? To you elders here tonight, everybody in your congregation is at point A. And if they're going to get to point B, they need help. God designed it that way. We've already emphasized that. We didn't design it that way. God designed it that way. They need leaders. And they need leaders that can provide resources that can help people take the steps that they need to take. When I studied through this passage and and I thought about Paul saying that to them and how he didn't hold anything back, I just thought to myself, because maybe outside the church of Jerusalem, more is said about the church of Ephesus than any other church in the New Testament. Because you read about it for several few chapters here in, in Acts. You read about it in, in Ephesians. You read about it indirectly and kind of directly as Paul writes to Timothy in First and Second Timothy because he was doing work there in Ephesus. And then one of the seven churches of, of Asia in Revelation, you get another great picture of them. And, and so really, it's, it's one of the neat churches that you get to see some heavy writings and acts about their beginning. You see writings like this as it's a few more years go by in Ephesians and, 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 uh, and then First and Second Timothy. And then you get to see them in Revelation. And so it, it's really a neat... And so that got my mind churning. And I thought, you know, you really could probably get a pretty good picture of when Paul is, is, is referring to the fact, I held nothing back. And that just got me thinking, what are all the things that Paul did for them if he was going to hold nothing back? And for time's sake, I'm going to have to give this more like a list. But think with me for just a moment. If we were going to think about things that he, he didn't hold back, in Acts the 19th chapter in verse 8, he uses, this is when he first came into Ephesus. And remember, they were they, they, the, the 12 that apparently had been taught by Apollos. We don't know that for sure, but it seems like they had, and they'd been baptized in John's baptism. And so he deals with that. And then immediately after that, if you will, look with me in verse 8. And it says, And he went in the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now that word reasoning is very interesting, but for this lesson, let's think about that word persuading. What did he say? He said, you know what? I went into the synagogue and I persuaded people about the kingdom of God. Every one of us right here that are Christians, if, if we wanted to take the time to go around the room and say, who is it that had some kind of persuasion in you becoming a Christian? Every one of us here can name somebody. Ideal persuasion is you need somebody to help you make that first step. A good salesman. What's a good salesman do? A good salesman convinces you to take that first step. Any of you that lead singing, I could say, who persuaded you to lead your first song? And almost any song leader can say, I remember his name was, this was my age, this is the situation. Boy, you remember those people that were what? Leaders in your life. Those people that they were able to get you to, okay, right here's A, I'm not a song leader. Right here is B. Now I'm a pretty capable song leader. Well, who helped you get from A to B? Because you don't get there by yourself. And every one of us could say that. Well, see, as elders, this is the challenge. Everybody's at A. And if they're going to grow spiritually this year and be more mature by the end of this year or calendar year or, or 12 months from now, what do you need to do? Well, see, now you're back to you got to know them. You got to know them to know what persuasion do they need. You may have people that are visiting your congregation that aren't even Christians. Are you going to persuade them to become a Christian? One of the resources that Paul used regularly in his life of leadership was that of persuasion. A second thing that I noticed back in that same Acts 20, we're reading in the same paragraph there to the elders. Look at verse 33. And this is the resource of work. Notice what he says in Acts 20 and 33. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. 
I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of our Lord Jesus that He said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul, what are you teaching us here? He looks to the elders and he says, remember, I'm telling you things you need to do that I've already set the example when I lived with you three years. What's something elders don't need to do? Be covetous. Well, what's a better thing than being covetous? Being content. And then being a hard worker. He said, I took my own hands and I labored not only for me, but I labored for those that were with me. And then in that next verse, he says, I did this showing you my example. Contentment, hard work, in order so that you can generously give. What a beautiful example that every elder must have in his life if he is going to be the resource to others. It takes work to be what God wants us to be in this life. It takes getting up a little bit earlier or staying up a little bit later or just working a little bit more time. It's impossible for a man to be the man of God as a leader that God wants him to be if he's not willing to roll up his sleeves and set the example and work. A third thing that we see is prayer. See in this very same paragraph, we come to the end, and if you picture this, it's really touching. In verse 36, and when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied to the ship. See that love that's there? The relationship is real. Because remember back earlier in the passage we read earlier in this paragraph, remember he said that I lived among you. If you've never studied that as an elder, I would challenge you to study that and study it as Christ. Here Paul says, I set an example for you. I lived among you. You go home and you live among them. 1 Peter the 5th chapter where he's talking to elders. Peter uses that again to say that the elders live among you. When Jesus came to this earth, how did He have such a powerful impact? Remember in John the 1st chapter in verse 14, that the Word became flesh. And where did He dwell? Among us. And because He was among us, John says, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, how did you know He was full of grace and truth? Because He lived right here among us. Leaders, 1 Peter 5, you lead by example. What good's an example if you're not living among the people? And so now this man that had lived among them was getting ready to go. And what just naturally happened? They prayed. They cried. They fell on his neck. They couldn't even say goodbye without following him all the way to the ship. Let's go back to that a prayer of just a moment. And and let me show you this. I know we're, we're going to have to close this session. Look with me at Ephesians and let's look at what he prayed. And this is something I can show you briefly, but I I hope you'll study this a little more if you haven't thought along these lines lately. We have two beautiful prayers of what Paul prayed in Ephesians. And um, the first one uh, begins in the first chapter in verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him, that the eyes of your understanding being lightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of His glory, of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us, who believe according to the working of His mighty power. All right, and you see where that prayer is going. Skip over to the third chapter and look at verse 14. Third chapter and verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory 
to be strengthened with might through His Spirit to the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul, where were you when they wrote that? I'm in prison. Paul, do you think anybody in Ephesus was sick at the time you wrote it? Probably so. Do you think anybody was taking a long journey when you were writing that? Probably so. Paul, don't you think you missed something? Haven't you heard our prayers today? Because we don't pray a lot like you. If we're not careful today when we pray... 95% of our prayer is about physical things. We can go around our Sunday morning adult classrooms and look at the prayer request that's been written on the boards. Cancer, in the hospital, taking a long trip, going through some tough times at work. You know what I long for? I long to see a day beginning with an eldership down. We become a people that prays like Paul prayed. It was so spiritual. I want you to have understanding. I want your eyes to be enlightened with the light. I want you to know the power of God. I want you to set your hope on the glory that's to come. I want you to know the length, the width, the depth, the height of God's love. For this reason, I bow my knees. Is it wrong to pray for those other things? Not at all. Cast your cares upon Him, for He cares for you. But wouldn't it be a shame if the only cares we ever cast upon God are things that have nothing to do with eternity. Paul, what's the resource you're giving here? Do you notice that again in in verse 20, verse 3? Now to Him who's able to do exceedingly Abundantly above all that we ask for things. Paul, what did you give to the people you led? I'd go to my knees and I would pray about everything that I could pray about that would have to do with their eternal life. Because I knew as much as I can do, it's nothing to compare with the exceeding abundantly way that God can answer prayers. Powerful resource that we ought to offer. Tonight, I love, I love preachers. I've grown in my life to really, really love preaching. And some really, really good men that I know were preachers. But you know, I didn't grow up in a preacher's home. I grew up sitting at the Sunday lunch with my granddaddy being an elder. And during my teenage years, my dad became an elder. All my life, I've been around elders. I've seen the burden they carry. And I've seen the great weight of responsibility. And I've seen the way it rarely is thanked the way it's deserved. And tonight I just want to close by saying to you that you are greatly loved and appreciated. 
the work of shepherding God's flock. There's no work on earth that is more important. And each one of you, that you've set it as your life's ambition as an elder to help everybody that's at point A to arrive to that ultimate home of point B. May God bless you richly upon that journey and may you lean upon Him in every step of that journey. And may you never let Him down. God bless you. If you have kids in the child care, uh, after the prayer, if you'll go get them so that the people who are watching them can get some snacks and uh, a break as well. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we thank you so much. You've given us so many blessings and we thank you in general for so many things. And tonight we are especially thankful for our elders here at this congregation the work and the hours they put in, the love that's in their hearts, the patience and the steadfastness and the devotion and the commitment that comes from them and their wives and their families. Father, we don't thank them enough and we don't hold them up as much as we should and we are sorry for that and we pray that in the future we will appreciate them more and that we'll be more active in our encouragement and that we'll follow them as they lead us toward heaven and towards spiritual growth. Father, so many of us uh, in this congregation and everywhere in your church, we settle for where we are. We settle for the fact that we may be further along than someone else, and we let that be good enough. We're thankful for the men who push us, and we're thankful for the men who, who see the vision and see that we can be more and we should be more for you. And we pray that we'll all be inspired and challenged by tonight's lesson, by the word that you've given us in the Bible uh, to follow our, our elders. Thank you again for them. Thank you for bringing them to us and may you bless them with many more years of service here. As we take a break and enjoy some food, please bless it. And please bless our fellowship together, and may we grow closer together. And we're thankful for Brother David and the way he's able to bring your word to us in such a powerful way to inspire and motivate us. And we pray that you'll bless him over the course of the next couple of days and that you'll help him to deliver your word in, in powerful ways that will change our lives and change this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen.